Welcome to the Gut Pharmacist Podcast. I have a very major name on here today, Dr. Jabin Moore. We'll be talking about stealth infections, mold, heavy metals, parasites, and all the things in between, all the things that Dr. Jabin is very well known for. So thank you so much for being on my podcast, Dr. Jabin. Oh, thanks for having me. I just want to continue to educate as many people as I can every day. It's it's a passion from uh, my history, right? Like, I had Lyme myself, so I know how hard it is and, and how few people actually realize that these infections can create so many of the common symptoms we deal with today. Yeah, definitely. And that's why I wanted to have you on. So I know you have your own history with chronic illness. Kind of go briefly into that and what kind of things you had to deal with to get to this point. You know, it started back at 10 years old for, well, my family, because my mother ended up getting really, really sick, and we just didn't have any idea why. And um, she gained 100 pounds. She was on, I don't even know, 40 pills a day, prescription pills a day for everything that's from your common stuff to blood pressure and cholesterol, diabetes to chemical depression, thyroid. I mean, the list was really long. Uh, you know, I just kind of look back into my history, and I remember it, and I remember her almost becoming like nocturnal, like her circadian rhythm got really off and, and she just wasn't functioning very well. And, you know, she got hit by a car uh, on after dropping me off at school when I was 10 years old and the ER asked her if she was diabetic and she said no. And then they ran a couple more tests and they're like, you are diabetic. And, and that kind of just springboarded me into realizing that it wasn't necessary that her doctor was purposely trying to harm her, but just didn't catch all the pieces. Right. And, and that's, that's that springboard for me that made me realize that, you know, there's probably an answer out there why you're not feeling well, your body is supposed to work well. And if you really dig deep and fight for it, you can probably find a solution that will allow you to get back to real health, real true vibrant health in a lot of cases. And then I ended up getting Lyme disease at 25 after living in a moldy apartment and didn't even put together that mold was a causation for me for years. Went on that long search of seeing doctor after doctor after doctor, asking everybody when I was in school, how am I sick? Why am I sick? What is going on? What can possibly be the problem? Because I was in Cairo school and I had an opportunity to go to trainings and there'd be 50 doctors there and I'm just talking with them. They're like, what do you think is wrong with me? You right. know, I got that opportunity. <laughs> And so many didn't have an answer. Well, I finally figured out Lyme. And by that point, I was having hormonal issues, erectile dysfunction. I was having brain fog, pain, fatigue. My knees were all messed up. I, you know, going upstairs was hard. I'm 25 years old. I wasn't overweight. I was fit. And after figuring out Lyme within a few weeks, I actually started feeling better once I got the right type of care. And here I am today. You know, I just got done playing uh, beach volleyball with my wife's family and all the 25 year olds and 20 year old athletes. And I'm playing with them and diving in the sands. Like I've recovered. I feel good, but it wasn't a straightforward path. Right. Yeah. And that's for so many of us practitioners, we have our own story. So thank you for sharing yours. And it sounds like yours and your mom's buckets just finally overflowed and you started to get those symptoms that piled up for many years, just like so many other people. We commonly see people being misdiagnosed in allopathic medicine. So what are some common diagnoses that may actually be a result of infections like mold, parasites, and then heavy metals? So, I mean, there's definitely a large number of them. I'm going to throw out some research first, right? So about 25% of people dealing with MS when they have an autopsy in their brain, Borrelia, which is Lyme disease, will be in the brain. Now, obviously, this is postmortem, uh, but 25% of people have Lyme. 100% of the brains that were autopsied in one study had nematodes for people that had MS. So 100 out of 100, which is an incredible stat. Anytime somebody walks into my clinic and they have rheumatoid arthritis, the immediate thought for me is, Let's let's rule out Lyme disease or Babesia, Babesia being a co-infection for Lyme. So that's immediate thought for me. It doesn't mean that they have it, but there's a, a higher likelihood. And then 
you know, something that most people don't realize is there was a Kaiser study done where if you had childhood trauma, which I know isn't a stealth infection, but childhood trauma, you were 80% more likely to develop an autoimmune disease as an adult. Right. So when you, you mentioned bucket being full, it's like that's one of the pieces of the bucket that I don't like people to to miss. Now, there's been studies done where they actually remove teeth from people that had root canals. And in that root canal, if you look at this through testing from DNA connections, you can actually find that Borrelia, different parasites, other bacteria are in the root canal cavitation so if you remove that tooth, they actually implanted that into animals like rabbits and the rabbit would then, because of the bacteria, the infections on it would develop the same diseases as the humans. Wow. So you, you start listening and, and reading and researching, you start really seeing that things like fibromyalgia, for instance. Okay. If someone walks in with fibromyalgia, I'm going to go, do you have Babesia? Do you have, which is a parasite, a small single cellular organism parasite. What about, do you have strongyloides, which is a nematode, which is a multicellular small parasite. It looks like a grain of rice. Um, so fibromyalgia, RA, MS, these are often times just given as a diagnosis, but realistically they're, your immune system is dysfunctioning. And the doctor that diagnosed you with this is seeing signs of an immune system that's dysfunctioning. And they just gave it a name instead yeah. of saying, well, what's causing this dysregulation of the immune function and then getting to the bottom of it and going, oh, it's, you know, whatever, strongyloides, babesia, Lyme. You know, anytime somebody comes with IBS, do you have a parasite? Do you have SIBO, do you, which is a bacterial infection? Do you have some sort of other fungal overgrowth like candida yeast? So when I see diagnoses come in, I immediately go to what can cause this and how do we remove that thing? I love that. And I often call those diagnoses like surface diagnoses. It's great that we have the label. Now let's find what's causing them, which isn't very common in most clinics today. Mm -hmm. So we see heavy metals, mold, parasites. They often all go together. Why is that? Well, it's because as you get toxins, infections into your body, they start to suppress. And as they suppress your mitochondrial function, which is your powerhouse, which by the way, that's what they say in middle school. Mitochondria yeah. is powerhouse. <laughs> yes, I remember. Mitochondria does so much more than that. It also regulates your immune system and your hormones. So as your mitochondria get suppressed, let's say by mold, now your immune system doesn't work as well. Now your energy and your detoxification systems don't work as well. So then bacteria that's already inside your body that are naturally there start to overgrow. Candida, which is a fungus, starts to overgrow. The parasites that are in our environment around us, every single one of us, you've got a cat on your wall here, which carries Bartonella, which causes carries toxoplasmosis commonly. So that's one place we can get parasites. Our food, you can get parasites from your food, whether it's vegetables or meats, it doesn't matter. Both have potential parasites on them. So parasites in our environment, we get that into our body. And because of the suppression of our immune system and energy system for mold, now you have this smorgasbord of infections that are normally able to be defended by your natural immunity, natural body leak function. And the same goes for heavy metal toxicity. If you're drinking tap water that's dirty, or if you are drinking radioactive tap water, which is 163 million Americans, mm -hmm, that was drinking me. radioactive water from the tap. And the only way to remove that is distillation. So even though some people are trying to do really good things, it's just not enough. And I've seen switching to distilled water. So removing the toxin burden from coming in, then we can start to flush out the toxins from inside out. And now you actually see infection load start to decline because the body no longer is weakened by those infections. So the body starts gaining strength and starts doing what it's supposed to do, which is defending itself. So, so often it's one cause starts it. And then you start stacking other pieces of the puzzle, which is like, you work too much. You don't sleep enough. You don't eat enough food, you eat junk food. You're drinking bad water. You are not using Pla or you're not using stainless steel or glass containers. You're using plastic, which then causes uh, hormone dysfunction from the mm -hmm. phthalates and the BPAs, which are other environmental toxins. So again, it, it's just like this. We live in an environment that 
has to be navigated, which some people are going to listen to this and go, man, that's so overwhelming. It's like, to some degree, it can be, but at, at the same time, your body is so resilient. If you do some of the basics, which we can talk about later, if you like, yeah. Um, if you do some of the basics, your body stays pretty darn strong and can keep infections at bay. Whereas once you're already sick, sometimes we have to work through a lot of those different infections to get you back to well, because your body is so under the, you know, the stress of so many things. Right. Give your body exactly what it needs. Get out of its way. Let it do its thing. I love that. Now, is there a specific order that you address all these infections and heavy metals? So every single individual has their own personal order. Mm -hmm. But after, I don't know, 6,000 patients through my clinic, whether they were my client or some of my doc's clients, we've seen a, a order emerge that's pretty, pretty straightforward that works for probably 70% of people. So if you're listening out there, this order may work for you, but again, you are an individual and your experiences count and we need to make sure to tweak it to that. But the first thing I always tell people is you gotta live in a safe place. So we gotta make sure it's not moldy. We gotta make sure we're drinking clean water and, and breathing clean air. So if you live on a golf course, you need air filtration because they're constantly spraying chemicals that's uh, getting into your home. Those chemicals being pesticides, herbicides, et cetera, that will damage your mitochondria. And it keeps going back to that mitochondria, right? So you've got to keep your energy system and your regulate, regulatory systems in your body healthy. Otherwise, everything breaks. So live in a safe place. This also goes to safe people around you. And if you're living in the middle of a war zone, your body's probably stressed out and not operating well. I had a client one time who was very chronically ill. She grew up literally in a war zone, had tons of childhood trauma, and had never worked on that. And when she told me her story, I was just like, oh my gosh, that's 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 so heavy. Let's see if we can support your nervous system. And that's the second step, which is make you feel safe because she wasn't in that environment anymore. So we go live in a safe place now feel safe. So we got her to start working on the nervous system. We did primal trust. We did neurofeedback. We did EMDR. Her nervous system calmed down, which then took and made her feel safe at home. So we we did step one, step two, step three. We started to rebuild the things that her body had depleted of. So we ran a hair tissue mineral test. We remineralized her with the things that she was missing. We ran a organic acid test. We got the vitamins back in her that she was missing. And then from there, we went into the step of opening up drainage and detox pathways, which if you do that too early, you actually can cause more issues. So if I start just giving you a bunch of, say, milk thistle or a bunch of mitochondrial supports without opening up drainage pathways, so liver, lymph, your bowel, making sure you poop every day, then you can start releasing toxins into your system that recirculate cause more issues. So we start opening up the detox and drainage pathways through things like dry brushing, castor oil pack, coffee enema. I give herbs like milk thistle, tudka, ox bile to support the organ systems that are supportive in, in drainage and detox. Then we get to the fun stuff. This is the stuff I love talking about, right? I get to go <laughs> to the bugs and I'll tell you all a story that takes two seconds. I had my website designer building my website. And I was like, yeah, make sure we get plenty of information and a an individual page for each bug. And this is a person that's been in my clinic for years. And she knows I, I jokingly call them bugs because Lyme's a bug, parasites are a bug. Right. Is a bug. <laughs> she literally put bugs as the top of the <laughs> Love web page. And I was like, um, we're going to have to put infection. She's like, I've literally linked this to 40 different places and put bugs everywhere as the title. Oh, no. And I was just like, I am so sorry. <laughs> we have to change that. But anyway, so that's what I'm referring to when I say bugs. Like we get to the bugs, we get to the infections, the stealth infections, the stuff that's fun to talk about. And the first stealth infection, which is kind of part of my, my drainage detox funnel, not just the, the infections part is parasites because parasites can actually get into your colon. They release endotoxins. They stop you from pooping. They can get in your liver and make it to where they don't, the liver can't filter quite as well. They can get in the gallbladder and gum up the, uh, the bile duct. So parasites for me come first in most cases, about 70% of the time, because they can actually block 
the ability to move toxins out of your system. And then after that, it goes bacteria, mycoplasma, mold, fungus, heavy metals, radioactive elements are in there with fungus. It just depends on which one you have worse. And then viruses usually come toward the end, unless again, you have some sort of major retrovirus issue that I have to deal with early on, which is why I was saying earlier, I was like, I reserve the right to personalize this to you. But in most cases, that is the order that I go. So just to, to say it quickly, it's live in a safe place, feel safe, get your energy system going and, and replenish your missing nutrients, drainage, detox, infections. And then at the end, it's just, you got to supercharge your mitochondria by doing things like fasting, red light therapies, making sure you got the right nutrients and, and then just continuing to live by that path of staying in a safe place, right? Like that whole journey that I just took somebody through to get them well, it's not that hard to stay there, but you still have to pay attention to it. So if you move and you move into a moldy house, you're no longer in a safe place. And you can get sick again. Right. And we've heard that parasites eat heavy metals. So tell us about that. Do parasites actually help us out with heavy metals and how does that work? Yeah. So parasites love all the toxicity of our environment. They feed on it. And when you're toxic with heavy metals that come from your hygiene products, there was a study done on 32 lipsticks, 16. So 50% had lead in it. Yeah. Wow. So literally women eat about four pounds, at least they used to. I don't know if there's a uptick or downtick since the study in, in lipstick usage, but used to literally ingest four pounds of lipstick in their life. And if it had lead in it, you're getting heavy metals. So be careful of your hygiene products. But as we get that in, we get toxic arsenic from our water supplies and we get aluminum from our deodorants and all this is going into our body when a parasite gets in us they feed on that metal by absorbing it because that makes them happy they can carry six to eight times percent of their body weight and due to that you become a perfect host if you have all this so mm -hmm. then you're just feeding these parasites and they're reproducing and they're happy and they're like this is i'm never leaving this place it's the best hotel i've ever been to <laughs> whereas normally your body would have parasites come in if you had some sort of toxicity, let's say in the 1800s, it would absorb that and then your body would kick it out and the host and the parasite would be like, this isn't a great host. I already got everything. There's no more for me to eat here. I'm going to leave and you'd release it. But now it doesn't work that way because we have a constant overload of toxins. So parasites in some way could be symbiotic until they get to a threshold where they're now pathogenic and they're causing you damage. Great point. And how about scars and root canals? So you kind of talked about root canals. How do scars affect our health? Yeah, so scars can affect your health because, so I was trained in, in Chinese medicine back in college and I've continued my training. Scars are at the fascial level. They're on the skin and fascial level, which is like your top couple layers here when you have skin. And your acupuncture meridian. So the way that electricity moves through your body is, is across this top layer. So when you check for an acupuncture point, if you want to do it scientifically, because it is now proven that, that acupuncture points and the techniques work, um, you check for the electrical conduction of an area and it changes based off of whether you're high or low in energy. So you just check the acupuncture points with a meter. So if you have a scar going across one of those meridians, which is like a blood vessel for electricity, that scar impedes the electrical conductivity. And that doesn't allow for your body to communicate electrically throughout your system. So scars, if you have them, need to be worked on. So there's things like neural therapy, which is injection of procaine or some different other things into that scar to help break it up. I personally, before I ever did that, did acupuncture needling into the scars and around the scar to break up the scar. And then also to get the chi, which is electricity. Chinese used to say chi was life force, but now we've realized, okay, that's electricity. They just didn't have a word for it. Um, so that electricity through the body and then at the same time, you can do something called mudding, which is where you get really specific type of mud. I actually haven't done this. I'm really excited. I get to do it here with some friends from uh, Thersage. 
and you mud the scar and it actually helps to break up the scar tissue and get the energy flowing. So there's a few different ways to do it. If you don't like needles, um, you can always do the mudding, but the scar impedes the electrical conduction, which would be no different than if you have computers with wires and I go and cut the, the wire. Now that communication doesn't get through. So your body starts to break down. So it's really important to make sure that you take care of those scars. I had women with C-sections where they've had stomach aches in their lower stomach or bloating in their lower stomach for a decade. And then they came in and I'm like, they're like, oh, my stomach hurts. And I'm like, well, let me palpate your stomach. Let me see what's going on. Oh, there's a scar there. Let me needle the, the scar. Done. Symptom relieved after 10 years, one needling and, and they were good to go. So that's how powerful scars can be. And I, I wanted to touch on root canals because they're such a major issue. I kind of briefly glanced past them, but if you do something to your tooth where you do a root canal, right? So what is that? That means that we're going to cut the nerve to your living tooth and cause the tooth to die. Well, it, it is bone, so it is hard, but it is porous. Teeth aren't solid. The inside of them are very porous and it will wear out over time because your teeth do actually heal themselves to some point throughout your life. They keep themselves solid or your teeth would just break down. So that enamel can be regrown to some degree. And if you kill it, it doesn't. So then you get a porous tooth. So now you have bacteria and infections that get into the tooth. They go down the root canal, the, the canal that the root has rotted out of into your jaw. Your jaw has a direct path to your brain, which will allow infections to affect your brain. If you have a cavitation, which is a hole that is grown because of the infection getting into it under that root canal or under a extraction, that can fill with infection. And as it as those infections live there and irritate your system and poop, they can keep your nervous system in a state of fight or flight forever, keeping your body tired, overwhelmed, stressed, beat up. I had a woman come to my clinic and she'd literally done everything. She'd done ozone and IVs and all the good at-home programs and supplements and check for mold. And I was just like, man, you've done everything. And as I'm going through her history, because I have this long checklist of, I've seen this once affect somebody. I got to dental work. She had a root canal. She had a bunch of them. And I said, well, go get a cone beam scan by a biodentist. And then when we meet again, we'll go over the, what they found and figure out if that's part of your problem. Well, I didn't see her for six months. She went to a bio dentist. They said, holy crap. And they got her in to, for care like a couple of days later. By the time she got back to me, she was like a new person. There was a little tweaking we had left, mm -hmm. but there, the, the bio dentist was like, whoever sent you here saved your life. And I'm, and that's not me trying to brag. It was just like, I was literally going down a checklist. Mm -hmm. And this woman just was full of pus. They said that pus was squirting out of her cavitation into her mouth, which is disgusting. I know, but that once they got that all sealed up, of course, her body felt better. How could it not? Mm -hmm. And wisdom teeth extraction is, is that kind of doing the same thing? Cause that's a hole in your jaw, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I have actually in my questionnaire now, cause I keep adding to it. It keeps getting longer. Right. <laughs> have you had wisdom teeth extractions because I used to just have extractions and everybody's like, no. And then I was like, so 90% of my clients haven't had wisdom teeth extractions. Okay. Have you also had wisdom teeth extractions? Yes, you have. Okay. Got it. So it's just a missing link in my verbiage. And I've sent several people and especially the ones that have been through everything. And, and, and I don't send everybody for a cone beam. I'm just like, Hey, so I'm marking this on our list as a, a, a possibility if we don't have success. And then some people just go get it done or it's, you know, maybe not on the highest part of their priority. Some people are like, no, go do that before we meet again. And so if you've had mercury fillings, if you've ever had a filling and you don't know, get it checked by a bio dentist. If you've had an extraction, a root canal, if you've ever had a tooth crack in half, if you've had dental surgery, if you have pain in your mouth, put that on your list of let's look into this, right? That doesn't mean you have to do it, but it's like, let's look into this. If I'm not getting well, trying these other things. Mm -hmm. Good to know. And so back to the, the Lyme and the co-infection. So we often see Lyme coming with so many different things, parasites, viruses, bacteria. So things like Bartonella or Babesia, can we see them by themselves or are they always with Lyme? So there are individual infections. They absolutely can come by themselves. So Bartonella, cats carry it. It's 
cat scratch fever, right? So this is a common infection that people with cats could get. Babesia is a parasite that can definitely be on its own. I've seen it, I don't even know how many times on its own, where Lyme didn't pop up. Now, Lyme's hard to test for, so was it there or not? Sometimes it's hard to say, but yes, they absolutely can be by themselves. Awesome. And then do we have to be bitten by ticks, fleas, or animals to get stealth infections? Are they transmitted in other ways, like being passed down? So stealth infections is a really broad scape there. Um, so let's start with kind of where that question is probably leaning, which is Lyme disease and its co-infections. So Lyme, Bart, Bab, they can come from any insect-borne vector that can bite you. They can come from uh, transfusions. They can come from mother to child. Some people say that they, they can go sexually. I haven't seen Loctite evidence on that, but I definitely have some cases where I'm like, that would make the most sense. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, Lyme and its co-infections can come from a number of different ways, but you know, you said stealth infection. So like EBV is a chronic virus that people deal with mm -hmm. and that can be passed from saliva. It's technically mono. So like the, the kissing virus, right. Um, it can come from uh, parasites can come from your food, from your water supply, from the ground, from the soil, from touching a doorknob, biting your nails, from your dog scooting its butt across your, <laughs> your pillow. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's so many different things that you can get infections from. The thing that I tell people is you have an infection or you have come in contact with a stealth infection. It is a foregone conclusion. Did your immune system and your energy system respond appropriately and protect you? That's the question that I have to ask you. And some of those toxic bucket, dental, nervous system, trauma, mold pieces of the puzzle help us to identify whether or not your immune system likely did or didn't respond appropriately and how we need to proceed forward to get you well. Nice. So it's always about individual terrain. I think that's the key there. We're exposed to all these different things, but it's how the individual body handles it at the end of the day. So it's known, just like you said, that Lyme, Babesia, Bartonella, they're very hard to detect in the body and traditional labs like, almost forget trying to find that, right? So how do we test for these stealthy hidden infections? So there are better tests than others. There's no perfect test for infections because let's just start with the fact that most infection tests are assuming that one, you got a sample of that organism if it's a DNA test. So you actually urinated it out or they got it in the blood draw, assuming that it's in the blood. Um, so you actually got the sample for a DNA test. The other type of testing is immune system response testing, which would then again, assume that your immune system and a person that's chronically ill or sick has a appropriately responding immune system, which we already know you don't, or you wouldn't be chronically ill. So these assumptions lead to the likelihood of having a high error factor. For instance, Lyme disease, and I just got uh, corrected on this by Global Lyme Alliance because they, they some studies came out and said it, that 476,000 people are diagnosed with Lyme a year or getting it a year. Yet the CDC finds that somewhere around only about 25,000 people test positive for their Lyme test. So vast difference in what is actually happening versus what the test is catching. So there are better tests. Igenix has been the gold standard for Lyme disease for a long time. Vibrant America just came out with a study showing that their test actually surpassed in uh, specificity. So Vibrant America now may become the gold standard. I don't know what will happen because that's pretty new uh, research that came out and who knows, it, it, but it's good that there are people trying putting effort out. I really do like the, the tick-borne panel 2.0 from Vibrant America. You know, you can test for mold in, uh, the urine. So a DNA test for the urine, but you can also test for it inside the body colonizing and you can test blood tests, looking for different types of inflammation and immune response markers for mold. Parasites are the toughest probably to find. Parasites are really difficult. There's no perfect test out there. Uh, parasites are cyclic. So they, they, they are out and about certain times of the month and then hidden at other types of the month. They reproduce at different times of the month. They may be more active at night than day. So you have to get the stool sample at the right time to even have a shot of being able to 
get a sample to then send off to a lab. The lab has to be equipped to find that type of parasite, which most only run 10 or 20 parasites, not a thousand, which is possible for you to have. And then beyond that, you have a technician that's taught to look for only ovum, not to look for other parts of the parasite, et cetera, which would be very different if you had like a trained pathologist that knew what they were looking for. And then you're making the assumption of most parasite testing that's going to be in the stool and that it's not somewhere else in the body that would not allow it to be in the stool. And, and then you don't have the test there for it. So parasite testing is really difficult. So for me, I like to run things like hair tests, organic acid tests, blood tests that tell me a lot about your body. And then from there, based off your symptoms and those tests, I can more readily identify what we need to be doing, what other testing we need to do based off of those pieces of information. And you can get a lot of good signs. Like if your eosinophils are elevated above five, which is a type of white blood cell, you likely are dealing with some sort of parasitic infection. If you have suppressed mitochondrial function in an organic acid test, you likely have either mold or radioactive elements in your water. If you have neutrophils, which is another type of white blood cell above 70, you probably have some sort of bacterial infection and it's something you start looking at. So when you're dealing with a practitioner that, that understands these signs, then they can take those signs and go, okay, let's look at your symptoms from symptoms. Let's look at your questionnaires that we have you fill out. Cause I've got a parasite questionnaire, Lyme questionnaire for people to fill out that, that gives me a higher likelihood. And then after that, I can run testing, but the best testing for Lyme may, may be 50%. Um, do I trust it? The best testing for parasites is like 5% that I would trust it. So right. sometimes we just go, you know what, let's do a parasite cleanse and see what comes out. Right. If you got a little st stringy friend that you find in your toilet, there's an answer. There you go. Good to know. I think this is all very helpful for people who are dealing with chronic illness and mysterious symptoms and they can't seem to find answers. I mean, it's guaranteed that we've all been exposed to these things. It's just how the body handles it. So thank you, Dr. Jabin, for going all over that. That was amazing information. So do you have any announcements? Tell us where people can find you, any resources to share? Yeah, of course. So, you know, I just mentioned kind of my my game plan that I, I go through and we actually just released what we call the uh, health foundation starter kit, which allows people to hear about a lot of the information I just went through in a lot more detail so that they can at least get to the start of their journey a little bit better because so many people miss something that's massive. They go through years of trying to heal, doing some really great things, but they miss some of that. So we just released that it's on our website for purchase. Um, and we're really excited about it because it's going to give people a springboard just to get in the right place. It's not a full get well program start to finish. It is here. Don't miss these really important steps. Let's take care of the basics. Make sure you're on the right track. And then you and your practitioner will be able to really hone in on the specific infections that you're dealing with from there. And then if you want more information from me, I'm constantly putting out information because I wish somebody would have told me all this stuff when I was sick. And you can find me at Dr. Javen Moore on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and my website. Awesome. And do you do telehealth? We do. So myself and my two docs in my clinic, we see people around the world. And it's honestly a lot of fun to do telehealth and get to know cultures from everywhere. So <laughs> it's awesome. Well, great. Well, thanks again, Dr. Jabin, for sharing all of this. And again, it's an honor having you on my show. So thanks again. Oh, thanks for having me. It's been a blast. Of course. Take care.